Hey, it's Lisa Z from RCP with Jim and Laura here. We want to warn our listeners that the topics we're discussing today are very important to all of us, but they may be upsetting to some people. And if you or someone you know is experiencing thoughts of depression or self-harm, please stop right now and call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. The line is available 24-7. It is free and completely confidential. Laura? And in the UK, you can call Hopeline, which is for the prevention of young suicide on 0800 068 4141. Or the Samaritans can be contacted on 116 123 Childline on 0800 1111. And if you're in Australia, there's the Crisis Support Service Lifeline, which is 131114. So what we're going to talk about, people may find triggering. And so it's important that you know what help is out there. And also, please do use your self-care tools as well. But we think it's really important to have this conversation, which is why we're going to be talking about key themes coming out of 13 Reasons Why. And in addition to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline in the United States, you can call the Suicide Crisis Line at 1-800-784-2433. New tonight, one of the most popular shows on Netflix has many concerned it will drive up the rates of teenage suicide. It's called 13 Reasons Why, and it has many asking why the program would highlight such a dark subject. Others believe it's opened a dialogue that until now has been silent. Say what you did. Say it. The fuck business is it of yours? She was my friend. She's dead. So what does it matter? Just say it. You need to calm the fuck down. No, I need what I need, which is for you to admit what you did. Here, right out there, a week before she fucking slit her wrists and died at home, you raped her. She came to my party. Mine. She got in the hot tub with me without a suit on, right? And she fucking, she made eyes. I know that's hard for you to hear, that your little crush wasn't pure and clean. She fucking wanted it. Hello, and welcome to Real Crime Profile. This is Jim Clemente, retired FBI profiler, former New York City prosecutor, and writer-producer on CBS's Criminal Minds, as well as one of the hosts with Laura Richards on the upcoming season of The Case Of. And with me today is... Laura Richards, criminal behavioral analyst and former New Scotland Yard and founder and director of Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service. And I'm Lisa Z, casting director for Criminal Minds. And I just want to say I'm so excited that we get to kind of pique our audience's interest for your upcoming super secret project. Yeah. I'm like, well, I'm we're needles. excited as well. <laughs> we are definitely because it's another opportunity to actually drill down, do a real investigation with real investigators about a case that has everybody talking and there's a lot of unknown mysteries involved. And we believe we will be able to help everybody understand better what really happened in that case. That's right. It's a case that our listeners have been really clamoring for you guys to cover. And I'm so glad you will be. And uh they're going to be gone for a few weeks, just like they were last time, guys. So you're going to be stuck with me. Uh, but I got some really great guests lined up. I'm so excited to um, bring them on. Um, but be yeah, great. But we are now covering the last four episodes of the series "13 Reasons Why," and we're at episode ten right now. And in this episode, Hannah's suicide is directly connected to the death of another student. And that is Jeff, who died in a car accident shortly after leaving Jessica's party. There's a convoluted way in which he actually dies in that accident. And unfortunately, a few people share the blame for why that happened. And what happened is that Sherry, who was leaving the party, accidentally hits and knocks over a stop sign. Hannah insists that she call the police and Sherry refuses and she said that her dad would kill her if he finds out. Sherry drives away leaving Hannah drunk and on the side of the road and Hannah calls to report it but it's late enough that Jeff not seeing the stop sign not realizing that he needed to stop goes right through the intersection is blindsided and killed by another driver 
And so when Hannah actually does make the report, the police are already aware of the accident there, and they think that she's just reporting that accident and not the accident that took down the stop sign. So it's a really unfortunate situation in terms of timing and and somebody doing something minor that has disastrous ripple effects. Huge chain reaction from something that seems minor. Yeah. And poor Hannah, she's already reeling from guilt about witnessing Jessica's rape by Bryce. And now she has a double whammy of feeling like she's also responsible for, in some part, for Jeff's death. And it also raises the theme again. Well, it's a theme that we haven't seen uh, come up just yet, but it's about drink driving of, you know, that we're led to believe one thing or his family are led to believe what believe one thing because we see various people drinking at the party, getting into cars and driving off. And, you know, his family believes that he was drink driving at the time, which obviously turned out not to be the case. But it does raise that issue for youngsters, you know, teenagers who are partying, getting into cars. That's the irony, because Jeff actually had been sober and gotten to the car responsibly, as had Sherry, who was the designated driver to uh, take Hannah home. So you do see teens trying to do the right right thing, you know, for their friends. But But then poor judgment. When you set up a situation where you are creating a condition that could cause somebody else to be killed, and you just don't do anything about it because you're afraid you're going to get in trouble. I mean, it's just a horrific thing. And so Jeff is driving responsibly, but doesn't know the neighborhood, doesn't know that that's a stop sign. And he actually plows into another car. And what this does, the ripple effect of that is actually tremendous. So somebody else gets injured, right? And Jeff's parents think that he was driving drunk and that he knocked over the sign. And so... They feel like it was his fault. One of the things that Sherry says is that nothing good could come from the truth if it can't bring Jeff back. Well, that's not true because the parents are suffering as well because they thought Jeff caused this. And that's just not true. And the truth, the truth coming out is much more important than making some, you know, just very subjective determination of whether or not this is going to help somebody or not, because you don't get to do that. You don't get to decide what everybody else gets to know. The truth should come out. And generally, the truth typically does eventually out. At this point, um, Clay goes to the playground and Tony shows up and asks if he's still afraid to listen to the tapes. And Clay says yes. And they actually, he actually pops it in a tape into the Walkman. And uh, we're finally going to hear about what Hannah has to say about Clay. Um, and at this point, it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, you know, an edgy situation because, you know, Clay up until this point has been, you know, sort of the good guy. And we want to think good things about him. But he's also been very passive and he's terrified to, you know, think that maybe he's the one who caused Hannah's death. Um, And it's a very uncomfortable situation. He actually asks Tony whether he did cause Hannah's death. And Tony says yes. And so that's how we're left with this kind of cliffhanger at the end of episode 10. And it is a real cliffhanger because, of course, it all centers around his dilemma and just his pain about somebody that he really cared about. How is it possible that he contributed, knowing that everybody who received the tapes contributed in some some way? So that, for me, was a real cliffhanger, wondering what the big reveal was going to be and just how and when he would be able to listen to the tape and how he would deal with whatever it was that he hears. Right. And and that brings us to episode 11. And in this episode, we do find out that, in fact, our feelings about Clay are probably right, that he's not at all in the same club as the rest of the people that are on these tapes, and that Hannah basically saw him as innocent. Basically, the situation between Hannah and Clay was that they kind of had a fun night together, and they start making out. She basically stops their session and gets 
bed and screams at Clay to get out. And it's really kind of a weird situation. We don't really understand what the motivation is behind that. But there is, you know, his reaction to this is not not really helpful. Um, yes. So this is something, Laura, I don't know if we can talk about <laughs> how this is for a girl when she's sort of you know, moving forward with her sexual impulses, but her head is flashing through all different kinds of things, the messages that she's been getting from the society around her, that she's a whore, she's loose, she's this, she's that. Um, It's just incredibly confusing. It is. I mean, so many conflicting things, so many emotions, so many thoughts. And, you know, the, the travesty here is that obviously she is with somebody that she really likes and who very much cares for her and she cares for him. And these things just come right at the top of her mind and she can't reconcile all of these things together. And I guess sometimes that happens when you feel safe or or that you're with that person. And it's ironic that he's the one that sort of bears the brunt of it in a way. And he can't understand what's going on but the one thing I do like about this particular scene is that he asks her you know is this okay are you okay with this yes yes and that's a really important learning point again when we go back to the scenes where there's no consent but he does the right thing she says that yes she is okay and actually it's the thing you understand she does want to do right but she just cannot go through with it. And for him, it's mystifying because he has no idea what he's done having had that um, right. and, verbal from her. Right. And and basically on the tape, she explains to him that she did want to keep kissing him, but she had so many other voices in her head, like judging her and all the things that she had been screwed over by guys. And, and she, I guess she just kind of fell out of the moment and she stopped and she didn't explain it to him. And so he took one thing from that and she meant another thing from that and in the end it was one of the contributing factors and it's unfortunate and clay blames himself but he really is blameless yeah he had no way to know what was happening in her mind and and she's embarrassed because she you know she's she's consented and now she's pulling away from him and it's humiliating and she's it, she feels like she's crazy and she can't explain to him what's going on i mean she doesn't have the tools and neither does he they're just kids right so he blames himself for leaving for listening to her and leaving he says he should have been there and and this is a survivor's guilt situation and it's unfortunate but he really had no responsibility and actually what he he did was what he should have done listen to her and give her her space and that's unfortunately something that you know he regretted down the road but there was really nothing he could have done about that you can understand from a boy's point of view how confusing it is and how you feel rejected and, and did I do something wrong? Am I not, you know, it, it just, oh, it's just horrible. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm not a teenager anymore. God. Well, horrible for both. Yeah. And I want to make that clear because it's horrible for her that oh, yeah. she just can't process all of these things. It's just so conflicting and, yes, yeah, very confusing for him, the re- receiver of it. But he does do the right thing. She tells him to get out. That's what he does. He holds space for her. Yeah, that's what I believe that he does. He holds space for her. He's the only one who does that. And so for that, he does do the right thing. But of course, once he hears all her reasoning and rationale, of course, you're going to feel that terrible sense of I could have done more if only I had. But you can't mind read on these things. So I I think it's a very touching scene because there's just so much going on in just that short interaction. And again, it's just this almost, they were almost there. Yeah. You know, where it could have been so different. So different. And he imagines actually that he doesn't leave and that he tells her he loves her. And and that's, yeah, that's heartbreaking too because you see what could have been. and, And poor Hannah, you really want her to have somebody there for her, to love her for her. And connectedness, yeah. you know, to be connected. And you just get these this sense that the two of them really connect well. Their sense of humor, you know, just on every level. And, yeah, I just think it's in, it's, it's unfortunate. I think this is also where we see the the downward spiral of Jessica and the fact that she's increasingly getting into this erratic behavior, um, 
you know, she's showing signs that things are not going well. And this is when she shows Bryce her father's gun collection. Justin, at this point, knows that Jessica is really hurting. And, and basically, Justin sees Jessica kind of flirting with Bryce. And he doesn't understand that. And this is one of the things that, again, that's common in this age group, that, that people are reading into behavior and not understanding fully what's going on. And then they're feeling hurt and they lash out. And there's a lot of, of very impulsive reactions to things that have, that have actual, you know, um, you know precursors that, that make them more understandable if you spent the time or if you had the insight uh, into what was actually going on. It's also when Justin finally basically confronts um, the fact that that Jessica is hanging out with Bryce and flirting with him when Bryce raped her and she Jessica slaps him across the face and says she hates you she hates him and you know she screams it at him and and runs off and Jessica was pissed off that Justin would name what actually happened it made it more real again to her and she was trying to to forget it or just make it not have happened. But the other thing that's interesting is that to Bryce, it was no big deal. Yeah, all right, so huh, somebody said I raped you, so what? You know, big deal, right? I mean, it's just it just goes to how horrific that character is. And of course, who's the victim in all this? Jessica. And Jessica now is, you know, left alone and sobbing and having to deal with what happened to her. And unfortunately, Justin has to understand. The reason why he knows that Bryce raped her was because he let Bryce rape her. Yeah, he chose Bryce over her, basically. Yeah. yeah. And he's carried that guilt, and he's been racked with guilt for the whole series, too. So. Yeah, but look at the whole group reaction. You know, th this is a challenge. Why does Bryce just shrug it off? It's because to everybody else, it's just, it seems like a normal thing. There's no shock or horror or them being angry or you know, basically attacking him because of it. Right. Yeah. That's the problem. It's normalized and it's made to feel like it's a problem on the other side, the, whoever it is that, that the victim is and that they're the ones that have to process it and deal with it all. And everybody else just, you know, in this particular scene seems to think that this is perfectly normal and acceptable and it absolutely is not. Right. And this is a perfect example of when doing nothing is ab absolutely the wrong thing to do by accepting what he did, by not speaking out, by not doing something about it, you're condoning that behavior and you're making the victim feel completely helpless. Silence colludes. Yeah. That's what I always say. Your silence colludes. If you turn a blind eye or you say nothing, then you are saying by your silence that that is okay. It is not okay. No, it isn't. Then we have another th another scene um, with Justin and there's very clear domestic violence and domestic abuse where there's a challenge between Justin and the mother's boyfriend and then he starts to strangle him and he literally it looks like he's going to strangle, choke him out to the point he's going to lose consciousness. But, you know, mum tells him to sort of calm down otherwise the woman next door will call the cops. That's, that's the only thing she seems to be concerned about. <laughs> but, you know, is she in fear as well? Most likely. And Justin sort of looks to his mum to, to plead with her for her to protect him and choose him. And you see her just walk off and turn her back on him. And you know, this is a very, it's a subtle scene in one sense. Cause, and it's also something that's quite overt of the violence in another, but she chooses the boyfriend and he's out on his ear. And, you know, it's a scene that made me very angry because there's lots of kids who experience this and children who aren't being heard. And, you know, it's the better, the devil, you know, at times that you stay in those situations. I can completely empathize uh, with this character here and just not knowing where to turn. And then you have to make the split decision and he packs his bag and he disappears and feels clearly conflicted unloved and where's he gonna go must be it's very terrifying and, and lonely that's why Justin has been so loyal to Bryce because that's been the place where he's gone every time his mom kicks him out or he gets in a fight with her boyfriend he escapes and is with Bryce and so it, you know that's 
It's just another, he, I'm sure he feels guilty betraying Bryce, who's been like a brother to him, and that family's sort of been like his second family. Hannah Baker made these tapes before she died, saying what we all did to her, what you did to Jessica. To Jessica? She was in the room that night, hiding. Before we get to episode 12, I want to issue another trigger alert because this episode, for me, was one of the most disturbing episodes. It is a depiction of the worst day, the worst events in Hannah's life, and also had a direct connection to her deciding to take her own life. And I want people to understand that the topic is a very difficult one. If you saw this episode, uh, you know what I'm talking about. But if you are thinking about hurting yourself, if you know someone who's it, who, if you know someone who is, please reach out for help reach out to the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, reach out to the teen line, get help, talk to someone. Things can be made to be better. So in episode 12, Hannah, as a favor to her parents, basically takes, she's going to deliver the proceeds from the pharmacy to the bank for her parents, and she leaves the bag on the roof of her car and loses it. And she's very upset about this because her parents are in financial ruin as it is, and this is just the straw that breaks the camel's back. And so she's unable to, so she's unable to sleep that night, and she goes out for a walk and eventually finds that there's a party at Bryce's house. She sees that Jessica is totally drunk in the hot tub, and she invites Hannah in. So Hannah just strips down to her bra and underwear, and for the first time in a long time, she just says, I'm just going to kind of let go and, and act normal. Um, then Jessica hooks up with Justin and they disappear. And then Hannah is alone in the hot tub. And who comes in but the rapist, Bryce. And we know this is going to be, it's not going to end well. Yeah. But she tries to leave. She tells Bryce she has to go home. He won't have it. And he basically starts to sexually assault her as she's trying to and struggles to get out of the... And she's very obviously rebuffing him. She's definitely... I haven't... I didn't go back to watch this. I thought that she was saying, no, stop. But I apparently... Does she ever actually say those words? And well, she doesn't even matter if she it does. It doesn't matter. But... She tr tells him she wants to leave. She tries to wriggle out of his grasp. He pulls her back into the water. And then he rapes her and she is terrified the whole time and any of that is enough on its own he raped her he knew he was raping her this is not the first time he did it he gotten away with it with jessica and he wanted to get away with it with hannah as well i think that i mean the scene is quite graphic um you know in the sense that they do keep the camera on her face for a long time you don't actually see it happening, but the fact that it stays on her face and, you know, scene made me very angry. Right. Uh, because she does say clearly uh, everything about her saying she's got to go and she's not consenting to it. And, you know, it's the fact that he turns her around and I think keeping that camera on her face just tells you everything. Um, and then you just see her completely sort of go blank yeah. and it, you feel this out of body experience. And you disassociate right. with it. And so I think they kind of do that part well. Um, and, you know, when people say, well, what did she do? You're, you're instantly taking the focus off of, well, what did he do? And how did he do it? And did he check with her? And so, yeah, again, she is violated. And, yeah, my I felt very angry seeing this. And, you know, I think some people, they may take issue with the way that was shot and that it did linger on her face for so long, but I don't. I think that was a very powerful statement, and it made it 
all about her experience of it. You know, there was a similar scene like this in Game of Thrones a couple of seasons back um, where a woman is raped similarly and the camera lingers on somebody else's face while it's happening. And that that scene got huge backlash for not, you know, depicting the terror of the actual victim. And so I think, you know, perhaps that's what made this a different choice in how they shot it. And I uh, I completely agree with that. It was so hard to watch, but it's important to watch. Like this, again, this is what we're talking about. This is what it's like for somebody to go through this. And it's ugly and it's horrifying. And not just to go through it, but the victim shaming. You know, many people do say it's worse than the assault itself. It's people's reactions, the things that they say, the judgments that they make. And all of these things are explored in this particular show. So I think, you know, we, we talk about it, we have done on many other episodes, but that fight, flight or freeze, um, you know, in terms of what happens when people say, oh, I would have done X or I would have done Y. Well, absolutely, you don't know until you are in that moment. And in this situation, she she freezes with it. Right. And I think that what you said about the camera focusing on her, it is actually a responsible way to have the audience experience what she went through. Most of the time when you see something like this depicted, it does focus on what the offender is doing, but also it's over very quickly. And the fact is that these crimes can go on for a long period of time and it's horrible. And I think it was important to, to make that point in a, in a way that wasn't sexually graphic, but was graphic about the violence that occurs during the course of a rape. And so this is one contrast, I think, to some things that happen later in this series. So Hannah then goes home, and she basically, I think this is when she forms the intent to basically tell her story and possibly this is when she decided that she was going to take her own life. It's very unfortunate that she felt that this was the only way out. Uh, the fact is there were multiple other ways out. There is always hope. While you're still alive, there is always hope and there is always a way. You may not see the path clearly, but there is always a way to feeling better and to go on. And people do care. You know, this is where you have the scene where she walks home and her parents are both asleep. You know, there could have been an opportunity there to have the discussion. I'm sure they would have been absolutely horrified and some of those things, you know, maybe things would have changed the, the course of events. But again, just her feeling so isolated and alone and overwhelmed and that feeling that no one cared. Well, that, that's the feeling that, that that wasn't a fact in this situation. Right. And unfortunately, she didn't take the opportunity, whether she didn't feel that, that she could talk to her parents, whether she didn't feel that anybody would listen to her or believe her, whatever it was, it's unfortunate because it's not true. They would have definitely listened to her. They would have done something to help her, but she just didn't believe it at the time. So she makes a decision, and she basically draws out a, 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 a a map, a connection of all the people who hurt her. And she makes a determination. She will never be hurt by anyone again. And that, unfortunately, leads her to take her own life. Um, it's, it's a terrible, terrible thing. It's a sad, sad decision because it didn't have to happen. So I think that's also when she decides to create these tapes. And the tapes basically give her an opportunity to tell her story. One other thing that happens in this episode is where uh, we come into the present moment where all of the kids in this clique start to get subpoenaed to talk to, talk about what they knew about her. And the truth does start coming out. Um, Alex, who we see, he really wants to tell the truth. He, Tyler wants to turn Bryce in. Uh, uh, people start having a, a their come to Jesus moment to tell the truth. And we see Tyler, which I thought was such a chilling detail. We see him going and getting a, buying a gun from some red-haired shady guy in an alley. Um, and you see, oh my goodness, you know, the, 
this is a guy who's also been bullied and you kind of see the the road that he's going down and the cliffhanger we have at the end of this episode is that somebody has been wounded with a gunshot to the head we don't know who it is but we know a kid has been um kid is in the ambulance with a gunshot wound so there is just so much going on as it escalates to um the end of the series right but so clay at this point gets so incensed about what bryce did to hannah the fact that he raped her that he goes and basically confronts bryce and Bryce is just so nonchalant about the whole thing. Like, you know, I, I guess she she consented. We had a thing and off and it's on, just, is what he says as well. Just makes my skin crawl the way he just makes it sound like it was totally, you know, consensual. Yeah, but it was a lie. It was yeah. a complete lie, a fabrication meant to, to cover up for the fact that he knew he raped her. And it's just, it's outrageous. I mean, any person who takes advantage of someone else is just a disgusting excuse for humanity. And it's just, it's, it just goes to show you this whole, you know, they say it's kind of a football player kind of thing, but it happens on teams. I'm sure it does. But if you're a good person and you know this is going on, tell someone about it. Stop it from happening. It's your responsibility to pre- protect those who are not able to protect themselves. Anybody as a human being has that responsibility. But he actually goes one step further, doesn't he? He's saying, you know, that she wanted mm-hmm. me. She was pretty much begging me to rape her. Um, everyone and every girl in the school wants it. And, you know, it's it's really very concerning, this level of uh, entitlement from somebody at such a young age and you know it is that entitlement i wrote actually just reading my notes disgusting rapist in, entitled asshole just taking what he wants and you know then hannah's sort of dialogue was you know that people were judging her and perhaps she could have done more and felt like she was already dead i mean whilst that we, we hear her narrative so those two very different tracks across it and obviously clay trying to hold him to account and you know bryce well she never said no i mean it just it's all those things that just can get yeah rationalization minimization and complete entitlement yeah absolutely yeah and and he's probably right i mean you know this entitlement that bryce has you know he knows that he's he's gonna get away with it and that's why Clay goes there to get his confession, to actually tape his confession. Right, and that's the thing, that he does that undercover moment where he he actually gets him on tape admitting it, and and Clay loses it. I mean, he punches Bryce in the face. Obviously, Bryce is bigger than him, more powerful, and Bryce just beats the living hell out of Clay. And he's left there basically on the floor because that's who Bryce is. And he's a bully. He's a rapist. He's a disgusting human. He's a complete being. You asshole. You want to call it rape? Call there it you rape. go. The same difference, he says. Exactly. And what's great is that Bryce's confession basically becomes the fourteenth tape, and that is one that should be used to put Bryce behind bars. Um, but at the same time, Jessica is basically coming to terms with what she has had to deal with and she basically pours the liquor bottles down the drain and she takes a hot shower where she scrubs every inch of her body and that's something I can relate to. I remember in the movie Jagged Edge at Glenn Close, I believe it was, um, had that same exact experience and I think it's a good thing because she's actually dealing with for the first time what actually happened to her and it's revolting her. She's trying to get the stench of it, the feel of it off her skin. And that process, I think, is a good first step towards dealing with what somebody did to her, a horrific crime that was committed against her. Um, two things to say about that, though. The, the key is in this situation, this is long, long after her assault that she's scrubbing her skin. This is not something to do right after an assault. Well, you know. 
like I said in an earlier episode, what would have been great is if if 911 was called and they did a rape kit and they preserved that evidence because even if you don't want to report it now, even if you don't want to go through the process right now, it preserves the evidence so that if you do want to go forward later, you can. Oh, I didn't realize that. I thought once you go and you get that rape kit, boom, you get, you're on your way to coming forward, no? Well, you don't have to. You, you don't, don't have, have to complete to. that process. However, the statute of limitations is usually five to seven years on rape. So mm-hmm. you have that much time to get those issues addressed, get therapy, get help, be able to figure out how to stand on your own two feet, and then go forward. You can talk to the district attorney and have them hold off on that. You don't have to do it right away. And then in the UK, we have SARCs, which are sexual assault referral centres. So I was responsible for working with the Haven in Camberwell in London, where myself and a police officer actually wrote all the choices for a victim. So you can go to a SARC, you can have the police turn up because everything's under one roof you can as jim said you have your all of everything for the forensics done you can have your swabs and your samples and you make the decision at different times and actually the leaflet we we developed was called your choices or choice and so that people do have those options because you know processing these things at time you know can take some time and the main thing is that many of these individuals are predatory and serial and therefore we want to make sure that when forensics are taken that those uh, forensics are also put onto the DNA database and um, you know so that the police can pick up serial predators because if they're doing it to one person they'll be doing it to someone else. Real quick can I give a shout out to Justin Prentice who plays Bryce Walker? I mean this guy I thought he was just brilliant in this role. He was just an effortless asshole. I thought he just got it pitch perfect. And it must have been so hard to play a guy like this. And if you see him in in other... Let's hope so. Of course. (laughs) If you see him in other interviews, I mean, he's 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 as far away from this guy. Yeah. And and it must have been incredibly difficult for him to do these scenes such horrible scenes. I mean, it was hard for the female actresses, but it is very hard for a guy to do this. And it's a very, oh, it's just, you have to be an utmost professional to get through them. But predators anyway, and monsters uh, don't have two heads. And, you know, that's also important that, you know, it's not yeah, just one dimensional absolutely. as a character or characteristic. These are bad choices that once someone gets away with things, they just keep repeating that pattern because they feel entitled and there's no one to hold them to account. So, I think he does play that character particularly well, but I certainly don't want to give anyone the impression that, uh, you know, the characters and the perpetrators that Jim and I work on are very easy to spot because they are not. They hide in plain sight. Right. And and as you've said so many times before, 90% of rapists are known to the victim. And nice guy acquaintance offenders are the most common kind of offender. So it is something that we have to keep our eyes open about, that people close to you are actually posing the most common threat. Overnight, Netflix telling ABC News in a statement, we support the unflinching vision of the show's creators who engaged the careful advice of medical professionals in the script writing process. The producing team adding they provide suicide prevention resources and information on crisis hotlines in more than 35 countries on a sister website. So now this brings us to episode 13. And at this point, Hannah is trying to give it one more shot at, at, at a future, at, at life. And um, she couldn't bear the burden of being so depressed and being so alone and isolated that she goes to the guidance counselor, Mr. Porter, and he couldn't have fucked this up <laughs> anymore. Yeah. He could not have been worse. He's distracted. He's giving her horrific advice, and he is asking her questions like, did he force himself on you? And did you say no? Did you tell him to stop? The whole point is that words are not the only way that people consent or don't consent, that their actions speak volumes. And you don't have to say specific words, at least not in this country. But if someone knows that you are not wanting this any kind of sexual activity, 
whatever it is, to force yourself on that person in any way, to any degree, is a sexual assault or a rape, period. Yeah, this is a, a terrible scene where if you were going to write the script of the how not to, this was it. And there were so many signs that he missed. And of course, you know, counselors and professionals should be trained in these signs to understand, even if someone's not being on the nose about what's happened, this is the real one last chance. And yet the right questions aren't asked. There's no uh, professional curiosity. There's no inquisitive or inquiring nature about what's going on. And there's just victim blaming and shaming and complete closed down, not wanting to open up what's happening. And yeah, this is just, it's not just unfortunate. This is kind of unconscionable given that this is his job. That's what he's there to do, right, Jim, to ask questions, the right questions of the students that walk into his office. Yeah, and not victim blame and not tell her, give her horrific advice and not say, well, you know, I can't promise you that you'll never have to see him again or that he will definitely go to jail. So she decides not to give Bryce's name. And what guidance counselors should be doing is bringing her to someone, introducing her to someone who can address her issues properly, knowing that he does not have the skills to deal with this properly and also not taking it so lightly. I mean, she confides in him about a crime. He has an obligation, a duty to report that. Yeah, this scene really puzzled me and I'm not sure if it was supposed to or not. I mean, it just really bumped me because I felt like this counselor is just depicted very unrealistically to me that he would be so dense when she's completely laying it out there. I mean, maybe there are counselors like this, but you know, in my experience right now in 2017, um, counselors in middle school are very much aware of these signs and they are trained to handle this. So I was just, you know, really confused about what this meant, unless we're supposed to look at him and say, oh, this is what not to do. Like it's, it's a teaching moment here. I don't know. For me, I just found it incredibly unbelievable that he, it was played beautifully by Derek Luke and he, and maybe that's why I feel like he does see what's going on. So I don't know, for me, it just didn't, didn't jive, but regardless, um, it is, you know, kind of her last, you know, her last gasp and I, she ends yeah. up recording yeah, this but conversation. She ends up recording the conversation. Okay. But, you know, I hear what you're saying, Lisa, but I don't know about your experience, Laura, but I'm certain that I have heard of situations this horrific and much worse. Uh, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, situations in the Catholic Church. I mean, I was told to shut up by my guidance counselor oh my God. and not say anything again, and that it was my fault, it was my sin that I was sexually victimized. Mm -hmm. And there are many people, many, many people who have run up into organizations that tell them they're wrong for saying bad things about these upstanding individuals who, you know, are pillars of their community and how could they do those things? And it's going on today. Yeah. It's been going on for hundreds of years and it's absolutely wrong. So I think he does, Mr. Porter does personify that kind of unfeeling, uh, just non-capable, uh, you know, person who's in a position where he can help kids and in fact ends up hurting them dramatically. Absolutely, and there are professionals out there, sadly, not just the counselors, but other professionals, you know, who are very closed down to these things. And I see come up time and time again in pretty much most domestic homicide reviews, child abuse uh, cases, um, those where homicides have happened in a domestic setting with children and others where there was a lack of professional curiosity and uh, a lack of inquiry and asking the right questions. So sadly, it does go on uh, far more than I think most people realize. So I, I think just within this context, it's just, um, you know, it's not just unfortunate. It, it is angry making that there's just not one adult who's asking the right questions and being specific and trying to get to the bottom of what's going on with this 
young girl who is clearly crying out for help at different times to different people. And she's almost testing him in this scene as she leaves. She's waiting to see if he has, you know, a light bulb go off and run after her. And, you know, when he doesn't, this is the one person who is supposed to recognize all of these signs. And she says very poignantly, some of you cared. None of you cared enough. And neither did I. Right. So it's kind of her, her, her death. He's kind of signs her death sentence. Yes. And, you know, she basically, as you said, she recorded this. And she basically, when she's told there's only one option, you can move on. That is the worst thing to say under these circumstances. He should have actually given her an option that could give her hope rather than just telling her nothing is going to change, nothing is going to be addressed, that what happened to her is meaningless. It's just terrible that that happened. Um, In the end, uh, you know, she goes and we will not be discussing the details of how uh, she ends her life. Um, We will have a discussion later. about that in a, in a subsequent episode. But what Clay does when he finds out about this is he confronts Porter about <clears throat> Hannah and what he said to her. And Porter just unapologetically says he's not to blame for her actions. And, you know, and that's how he keeps living. And that's how he keeps doing harmful things to kids, I'm sure. It's a terrible, terrible Uh, example of what somebody in that position should be doing and shouldn't be doing. And if that person is the guidance counselor, then I can imagine that the guidance that he's given other students has to be just as bad. Well, the thing that Porter says, and I think that, you know, a lot of people say when someone ends their life this way is, well, we, we, we don't know why this happened. You know, we, we don't know who's to blame. And Clay's point is, yeah, we do. Yeah. You know, that, that's kind of the point of, of the whole series is this, this is a world where we do get to find out in painful detail each and everything that pointed her down this path, um, including this counselor. What we also find out then is that Sherry has actually called the police and admitted that she's the one that knocked over the stop sign, which led to Jeff's death. And so Sherry is making some attempt at redemption, uh, although it might not be a full attempt. And then they deal with Tyler. And Tyler is somebody who, who we saw early on was actually you know, engaging in stalking behavior and uh, peeping Tom behavior. And and he felt fully justified in that. But, you know, he has issues, serious issues, and there are indications that that's going to create an even more serious issue down in the future because he apparently, you know, he buys a gun and he's got sort of a hit list. And And ammo and all this stuff, yeah. Right. And that's dangerous as hell. And, um, you know, we've all lived through the the situations that have occurred during the course of our lives that, you know, where students have done horrific things when they've gotten their hands on a gun and or guns. And this is not this does not bode well. And it certainly doesn't bode well. They're giving a nudge to what's coming next. And, you know, this is the guy who has been fixated and obsessed with individuals and certainly with Hannah and taking all these pictures and stalking people. So, yes, it's an interesting nudge to to what is to come, along with the whole backstory about, you know, litigation as well for those individuals you know, I think the interesting nudge with Porter was understanding when he's got that scene, and I can't remember where it comes up, but he's talking to his wife, and they've got the baby, and he takes the baby, and, you know, you now understand that his conscience is certainly not clear or clean, and the litigation will run, but of course there are a number of other things that are brewing, and Tyler is certainly one of them, which is a dot, dot, dot. But they do try to tie up some of the other stories, even though they leave the Tyler thing sort of as a cliffhanger. But Jessica talks to her father about the fact that Bryce had raped her. and So that's a very positive, hopeful thing, right. that you can talk to your parents about this. And I'm sure it's very difficult for a girl to talk to her father about something like this, but you can. And I think that's a very, very hopeful message. Right. 
And, you know, Tony actually does something. He actually steps up and, and does what he probably should have done right from the beginning, which is provide the tapes to Hannah's parents, and including Bryce's confession. And that's the best indication that there is a possibility that justice will be done for Hannah, that this whole situation, everything bad that was done will come to light and that people will have to pay for the things that they did to to Hannah before she took her own life. And that's where the truth eventually does out, one way or the other. Um, will it out in a in a legal forum? Well, quite possibly, because there is evidence and Clay was prepared to take the beating in order to secure that. So he kind of becomes, you know, the hero that is doing these things at any cost, of, is at even personal risk. Um, and in terms of just having that conversation with Bryce, I mean, that, that's a that's a, a big deal. But we also get the uh, the Alex shot that he has shot himself and is being rushed to hospital. So did he shoot himself or was he shot? I mean, I, I was led to believe that it was self-inflicted, but perhaps it wasn't. Yeah, uh, we don't know. I don't think... I think it, it seems like he was suicidal, but we just don't know all the details at this point. Or we just didn't pick up on it because we were distracted by all the other drama, which yeah. I think is a good point. In fact, Jim, you sent me once that. Um, yeah. It made, me re- it made me think right. of that there's a commercial where you're trying to figure, what is the, the thing of the commercial is you think one kid is suicidal and is about to shoot up his school. And it's actually a totally different kid that you don't notice in the commercial. But if you're paying attention, you see all the signs. And that's such, that was a really powerful yeah. piece. And that's what I kind of felt like this show was trying to say is we're being distracted by the wrong things and other things are going under our nose, like Tyler assembling an arsenal and, you know, being bullied himself and like Alex becoming despondent over his breakup with Jessica. You know, simultaneous storylines are happening and moving forward and we're still not noticing. You know, the adults still are not noticing. Right. And But there are a couple other, you know, seemingly positive things that are happening, and that is Justin finally wakes up and realizes that even though Bryce and his family have been helpful, Bryce is disgusting, he is a criminal, he is a rapist, so Justin breaks it off with him. So hopefully you would think that Bryce might take that, you know, to heart, but no, he doesn't. He just can't believe. He just can't understand. What? What? Why? You know, come on, bro. What's up? You know, and it's just, that's ridiculous. But it looks like Courtney is actually taking steps in the right direction in terms of dealing with her sexuality with her father. And that's, again, something that's difficult to do, but something that she seems to be taking steps in the right direction for. But what does really worry me is that there is a major problem with Tyler and what's going to happen. I mean, who is going to get hurt by him? And it's just, this is a perfect example of how that ripple effect just almost never stops. I mean, when when people are doing horrific things to other people, there are real life consequences and it can drive people. It doesn't excuse their exactly. bad, violent behavior, but it can be an excuse they use to justify in their own minds why they would go forward and do things that are totally, totally wrong and totally violent. I, want, I, wanted to, I wanted to talk about um, the scene that they do depict, um, which I think we all feel like went too far in showing her method of killing herself, but the one and that could have been shot differently and still had a similar effect and all that. But you know, when you do, we need to, I wanted to talk about the reaction of the parents when they come in and find her. I mean, I am really glad that they showed that because I think for for people who are suicidal to understand that they are loved so much and what this will do to the people around them, especially, you know, I've had several friends of mine find their loved one who has kill themselves and how it's just you're never the same again they they will never be the same and i felt that that was just so palpable in um kate walsh and brian darcy james's 
performance in such a terrible scene to discover their their child like this. Um, I just I I really appreciated that part of it. Yeah, but that is the reality of of suicide, isn't it? The yes, the method is the way it's depicted is very very graphic, and I know many people couldn't actually even watch that scene. Um, but yes, the legacy of what it leaves behind, I think, is so important to show. The burden, the all these missed opportunities where someone could have reached out, the fact that the pain of living is too much, that, you know, in one sense, you see that, what it, what it takes to actually end her life, but you also get a sense of just, you know, her desperation and for the family sort of desperation of finding her like that, absolutely uh, horrific. But I want to say that if you are thinking about suicide, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255, 1-800-273-8255, or the teen line, 310-855-4673. And you can also call those hotlines if you think that someone you love is in a place where they could do self-harm. Anybody can step forward and get advice about what to do. It takes everyone to see the pain that some people are going through. Um, so never, ever, ever be shy to reach out and try to get help for someone and you, you care be about. Kicking off, uh, you know, a life-saving conversation. And so, in the UK, if that's where you are, Hope Line is zero eight zero 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 six eight four one four one. And if you go on their website, you can actually see they have um, various conversation starters that you can have a look at. So if it's your loved one you are worried about, check those out. Um, there's a Samaritans 116123 or Chardline 08001111. And of course, if you're being stalked and you are in the UK, you can call Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service. So while I think that we all, you know, ha could have our criticisms of the series, I am, for one, very grateful that it was made. I think there was just a tremendous amount of learning and teachable moments in it. I did see it as something that was very hopeful at the end, that these kids have learned something and we've all have learned something about, you know, the signs of someone around us who's suffering. And um, it was a tough hang there. Boy, it was a tough, tough thing to watch. I, I had to binge all of them to have it done in time for our podcast, but I think it was very powerful in the things that it that it brought up, things I've never seen brought up in another really wonderful series like My So-Called Life and um, any others. Friday Night Lights are all kinds of great um, TV series about young people, but I thought that this really covered a lot of important ground. Yeah, and and one of the things, though, that we want to add to this is that there is hope that you're not alone, no matter how isolated you feel. There are plenty of people who have felt the same thing, and there are also plenty of people that are there to help, and they want to help. And Reach the more out. we talk openly about suicide, the more we can start to get into prevention. And I think, you know, we have covered the, the, that there's help and the hope and the fear as well, and just the learning points, because there are so many with this particular um, depiction across 13 reasons why and like I said every training session I've run I've talked about this and I know people are going off to watch it I know many people in my rooms have been watching it too um, so I'm using it to train law enforcement and all sorts of other professionals from mental health social workers you know and really a lot of the times I am saying it's about being professionally curious asking those specific mm -hmm. questions being inquisitive and everything that the dash is about is about a risk model of starting the conversation, being specific about things that are going on and giving people permission to tell you. And that's what many people want. They want to have a very clear invitation to ask them about the abuse or about suicide and about what's happening to them. So please have that conversation. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Laura and Lisa, for covering 13 Reasons Why with me on Real Crime Profile. I think this is an important series, and I think that you're right, Laura, the conversation is the best thing that comes out of this. Please don't let yourself get into a situation where you think 
that nothing else can be done. There is always something that can be done. There are people who care, and they're out there to help you. Signing off now for Real Crime Profile. If you like our podcast, there are a few things that you can do. You can take two minutes and go to Apple Podcast and leave us a five-star review. You can also check out all Real Crime Profile offers and promotion and our sponsors in our show notes. Another thing you can do is go over to Facebook and like our Facebook page. And one last thing is please tell all your friends, family and colleagues about us and spread the Real Crime Profile word. Thank you so much for listening to us. We really appreciate you. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineered by Terrell Parham. Music composed by Simba Zumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107 or you can go on the website www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic violence, call the National Domestic Violence Helpline free phone 0800 2000 247. In the U.S., if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, safety, shelter or counselling, call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, 214-946-4357 or go on their website, www.genesisshelter.org or the domestic violence hotline on 800-799-7233.